My name is Dr. Angela Booker. I'm the Director for Diversity and Inclusion at Mercy University. I've been in that capacity since October 1 of 2019. And I am so elated, so excited to share um, this opportunity about my particular role at the university, as well as some of my alumni engagement with some of our fellow dogs today. So we did not let the rain stop us. We are going to again um, share and have some great conversation this afternoon about diversity and inclusion and what does that mean? Social action, social engagement. What does it mean to be an advocate, an ally, a co-conspirator? And how can you even take this past the arc? And what does it mean for you going forward in your career? All right, so what I'm gonna do is just continue to um, present here. So a little bit about me, um, what you may have seen in the bio that may have already gone out with the um, initial ask or request to attend this presentation is a little bit about my history and background. So for me, um, I've been the director of the Education Opportunity Center since 2018 through 2019. And with there, I had various roles, but a lot of the um, work that I did in that particular arena really prepared me for diversity and inclusion work. I worked with a lot of first generation students. I worked with a lot of, um, uh, minority populations. I worked a great deal with um, those that um, had different um, abilities, those that had different, um, had received different forms of discrimination, but ultimately my goal was to help them reach college and career success. And again, just making sure that those opportunities were afforded to them and providing resources and equal access um, and equity to those individuals and those populations through a federal grant that we had here at the university. So I was very, very proud of that work and it really provided a lot of insight into some of the conversations that we're having now about disparities in education, disparities in housing, disparities in um, wealth and financial gaps between different, um, different populations here in the United States, as particularly here in middle Georgia. And so again, that was some great work that I was involved in there. I'm um, just giving a little bit of background as I transitioned to diversity and inclusion work. Initially, my degrees were in STEM. Uh, my dissertation that I wrote in 2019 revolved around African-American women in STEM degree um, attainment. And again, that was very important to me because I was able to shed the light a lot on the different forms of racism, sexism, discrimination, implicit bias, um, even throughout their collegiate career as well as their career um, once they graduated. And so again, that really tied into the work that I do now with diversity and inclusion and just being able to have these crucial and critical conversations while using data to support the work that is done in our community to make sure that everyone has an equal and fair chance we provide equity and access to all our different groups um, that we see here, um, not just for our higher education population, but even so with the community um, which um, we also work and live within. Um, one of the things that I wanted kind of to point out here a little bit were, is my work with um, the UGA mentor program, the Black Alumni Leadership Council being a farm dog, um, as you can see from 13. Also my TED talk that really focusing on those, on those um, resources and the need and the, the advocacy for more minority, particularly women, um, particularly African-American women in STEM, and then also being a proud recipient of the 40 under 40 um, from the University of Georgia. But going forward here, I really wanted to talk about some of the ties that Mercy University had to the University of Georgia and desegregation. So if you haven't had the opportunity to hear this story or learn more about it, I think it's a really, really wonderful story about um, being persistent, resilient. I had the pleasure of attending the Black Faculty and Staff Luncheon a few years ago, where um, the uh, Mary Frances Early told her story and her connection to Martin Luther King and the civil rights struggle and the fight for equality, and then also admittance into the University of Georgia. And just looking at that tie between us and Mercer was that when I was doing some research back in January 6th of 1961, a judge by the name of William A. Bottle, who was actually a Mercer Board of Trustee, actually was the one that ruled to allow Hunter and Holmes to actually enter into the University of Georgia, which basically spearheaded that desegregation that you see here at the University of Georgia. So I think that was very, very important to note that there is actually a connection with desegregation and also with Mercer University and University of Georgia. So that was just one of the things I want to highlight here. We have ties all around, ties all around. But one of the first points um, that I wanted to talk about, um, we talk about diversity, inclusion, equity, access, and justice. Um, those are very hot topic buttons. We see them now on Fox News, CNN. Um, we see them, um, CDOs or chief diversity officers are like the number one jobs that you'll see being recruited for. A lot of major companies from Uber to Google to Apple to all these large major brands, even fashion houses like Gucci, Burberry, um, Starbucks, they're really NASCAR 
they're really going after chief diversity officers and they are going after them as you can see really really because they want to diversify either their workforce or either they're looking to have more crucial conversations about how they're meeting the needs of their um, those their consumers because again a lot of the things that we consume in the united states the united states is a very diverse nation and so there's a lot of conversation around racism sexism homophobia transphobia ageism ableism because a lot of times what they've seen is that a lot of these individuals that are in these marginalized communities have been discriminated against they have experienced prejudice isolation social avoidance and again these companies want to have that conversation like how can we mitigate this how can we mitigate um, people experiencing these things because again with these some of these can again lead to um, again legal reper, um, repercussions because that you may have discriminated against an individual and may have the harassment claim so that's very important that we really talk about it now when we look at diversity and inclusion a lot of times what we're looking at as you can see I did kind of like a little word blurb here you see all these great words when we talk about diversity and inclusion you know like discrimination allies safety norms community marginalized violence, demographics, um, background, religion, isolation, all those really words, pride, culture, gender, really, really make up the word diversity, right? So when we think about diversity, we think about ethnic diversity, we think about nationality, sexual orientation, ability, age, gender, race, religion, spiritual tradition, social economic status, veteran class, all those things kind of make up the word that encompass diversity. You know, University of Georgia is very, very diverse. Um, university which i know we are all proud proud of that and we're making some great strides with diversity there but again a lot of times with these companies that i mentioned earlier even some of our higher education institutions sometimes what we struggle with is inclusion a lot of times our faculty staff and students really reference not feeling valued not feeling supported sometimes always not feeling a part of the community and that is why we have a lot of work to do when we talk about inclusive practices what does it mean to have an inclusive environment? What does it mean to practice cultural humility, cultural acceptance, you know, cultural awareness? And so again, a lot of times what you'll see here is that diversity inclusion officers, diversity inclusion departments, faculty um, that may do research in this area, what we really, really try to do is try to really push to bring forth that awareness if it's not already there, and then help people to mitigate and understand how to really, really perform inclusive practices by making everyone at the table a part of that diversity spectrum feel a part feel welcomed feel included feel celebrated definitely feel celebrated because again you know as students you know as alumni if you don't feel welcomed you don't feel celebrated you don't feel appreciated you don't feel that you have equal access to resources and opportunities um then again more than likely you're not going to matriculate or either graduate or either be a part of that community and we know that's part of bulldog nation our community is everything so again looking for CDOs, we really wanna really, really push departments, colleges, student organizations through events, through programs, through educational trainings, through workshops, through webinars, to increase that awareness and understanding the importance of diversity and inclusion, equity, access, and then justice um, for all our participants, whether they're faculty, staff, or students in higher education, and then also the wider community in which our college or university is located. Now, as I transition here to the next slide, a lot of times that conversation when we start bringing awareness to individuals is drawn through critical or crucial conversations, right? So again, I call them critical and crucial because they're very important to our campus climate. You know, they're very important to making sure those individuals feel included, valued, celebrated, and welcomed. And some of the things that tend to be obstacles or hurdles to that inclusion or that to that um, campus climate are things like implicit bias. So I know we've probably heard a little bit about implicit bias, explicit bias. You may have even heard of the Harvard implicit bias test. Um, some of us that may be um, sociology majors or things of that nature, psychology majors, but if you have it, again, that's a test, um, a wonderful way to help you become aware of your implicit biases. And you know that those implicit biases are those attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understanding and more importantly, our actions and decisions in an unconscious manner. And so a lot of times our implicit bias really, really um, hurts us and when we act upon those things and we're not necessarily aware of them. Like when we perform such things as microaggressions, because again, our implicit bias, um, as you can see on the pyramid of hate on our screen here, those can lead to those microaggressions, those micro invalidations, those micro assaults, even those micro insults towards individuals, groups, 
um, particular um, individuals that may already be particularly already marginalized. Um, so again, we have to make sure that our implicit bias, things that we think thinking subconsciously, that impact our daily actions are not being used to discriminate or using to provide some form of social avoidance for other individual groups. So microaggressions are is a very hot topic word. A lot of people are talking about it um, they, with the book. So you want to talk about race, you know, when you're understanding how to have these crucial conversations. The word microaggressions often comes up. And so a definition for microaggressions, kind of loosely definition that I pulled together here, usually they're very brief and commonplace. Um, they're usually verbal in nature, but they can be nonverbal. And they're environmental indignities, whether intentional or unintentional. That's key there, intentional, unintentional. And what they do is they most oftentimes communicate this hostile or um, this hostile environment. They're usually derogatory slights. Um, they're used to intimidate, insult, or even invalidate an individual or a group because of their status in society. So again, when you see these microaggressions, these micro invalidations, these micro assaults, and these micro insults, they're really daily daily insults that really tear down like a th death by a thousand cuts is what someone may call it. And again, a lot of times this leads to what we consider racial trauma, um, post-traumatic um, stress disorder. And you talk about the physiological and psychological Im impacts of having to endure these daily insults by individuals. And so again, what you wanna make sure is that because of these biases, you want to make sure you're able to mitigate those by being aware of what they are. They have some great tests on the Harvard Implicit Bias Test. But if you look at this pyramid of hate, I point out bias first, because this is the largest category that I deal with that I talk about a lot here, because oftentimes what happens with your bias, it can lead you to make jokes, um, provide, provide rumors about individuals, um, engage in stereotyping individuals or groups or identities, starting to use non-inclusive language, when referring to individuals or groups. And then you also can see insensitive to remark. So a lot of times when we're dealing with these forms of um, discrimination or hate language um, through our code of conduct, usually from a higher education standpoint, this is what we see a lot of, those acts of biases. So it's really important that we understand what those are for us and how they can be a blocker for us. Um, also, you see stereotypes and acts of prejudice. And most oftentimes what you'll see is social avoidance. That was really big with xenophobia and COVID-19, where you saw a lot of our Asian um, members of our Asian American individuals our society um, being ridiculed, um, using some people using social avoidance towards those individuals. You saw name calling, bullying, and slurs. And then even sometimes for other individual groups, you can actually see de dehumanization. And I know I talk a lot about race here, but again, it's not limited to just race. So these microaggressions are not limited to race, discrimination, um, prejudice, Stereotypes are definitely not limited to race. You can still look, you can impact someone's gender, sexual orientation, their religion, their social economic status when you're talking about this pyramid of hate, when you enact acts of prejudice or discrimination. On a larger level, when we see acts of discrimination, we see economic discrimination, employment opportunities, um, education. There's a great little video going around YouTube if you don't understand systemic racism and how it impacts um, educational opportunities, healthcare opportunities, even housing discrimination. You want to make sure that you're looking at these larger acts of discrimination here. And then also as you escalate of the pyramid of hate, you can see acts of bias motivated violence. And now we've seen this all the times on the five o'clock news now. It's almost to the point where I think in our society we're becoming desensitized to it. And I think that is not a good thing. But again, it's very important that we acknowledge what these things are and where they stem from. You see acts of assault, you see rape, murder, arson, terrorism, vandalism, and even desecration of different um, different temples and ideologies and things of that nature. So we want to make sure that you're looking to really, really try to mitigate that bias because if not, if you're not careful, if you're not careful as an individual or as a society, we can actually end up with a genocide. You see now in the, in the news, we're talking about um, individuals going through forced sterilization. And so those things are not, not very good because again, those things can lead to genocide in our community. We talked about the Rwandan genocide. The, the Holocaust, all these things that have happened in our history, our history, and they really started this low level of this bias. And again, all these things, um, even another thing that I talk about too, they sometimes compile our intersectionality. And so again, we all have different, if you want to look at that by Kimberly Crimshaw, we all have different forms our, where our parts of our diversity intersect, right? And so again, I talk about a lot of times our crucial conversations or critical conversations about intersectionality. We talk about racism, we talk about sexism, we talk about our identities and how they're a major part of our lives and how we develop and how we um, grow at, in higher education. 
we talk about ageism, homophobia, transphobia, ableism, all these different topics. Because again, it's important that we bring awareness to these um, opportunities and that we call these things out when we do see them. Okay, and so again, these critical conversations can be hard. Um, if you don't know how to have these critical or crucial conversations, um, there's a great web, web series and YouTube series about uncomfortable conversations that you could watch. And they range a gauntlet of conversations and different talking points through diverse individuals, everything from race to religion um, to interracial dating, all these things are great. Um, if not, you can also treat the book, um, So You Want to Talk About Race. I think they have some great, great points there. Now, just kind of to put into frame these microaggressions, these micro invalidations, these micro assaults, I did want to share this picture here because, again, sometimes in the classroom, we may hear, we may see these things from faculty, staff, even our peers and our colleagues, okay? And again, so some of these comments may be like, you're, you're the whitest black person I know. Oh, I wouldn't have never expected you to be a science major. Are you a man or a woman? Do you speak English? You know, you're really good at numbers, right? Okay. And so if we had an opportunity, if we were in person, we'll kind of do an exercise on stereotypes and how they lead to microaggressions and these micro invalidations, these micro insults. And basically, again, this leads to these uncomfortable environments where people don't tend to want to reside. They don't want to live. They don't want to be a part because, again, they're having to deal with these daily insults. And a lot of times when people are being microaggressed or they're person that's actually making a microaggression, they may or may not understand what they are. So again, we just want to make sure we give a little bit of measure and grace, because again, you do have to be able to call these things out and be able to have the conversation to say, you offended me by saying X. Let's talk about this, how did this made me feel? And when you said this, this was a stereotype. This fell into discrimination. This fell into um, sexism, racism, ableism, and you have to call these things out and you have to have these uncomfortable conversations so that we can actually grow and learn together, okay? Now, when we're talking about taking action and calling things out, one of the things that people like to do, or we have seen over the summer, um, protesting in all 50 states, we've seen protesting all over the world. And again, they were protesting two things. We were protesting, you know, COVID-19, which is one pandemic, and we were also protesting and talking about um, social injustice. We were also talking about um, what police brutality, just to put a name on it, and what does that look like? And so a lot of opportunities that are happening on campus throughout your community, a lot of students and faculty and staff have been engaged in um, individual acts that we've seen throughout our cities, throughout our countries. And again, some of those things that we want to do, people are tired. They want to take action. They want to, they want something to do. They want something to read, to act, to donate, and to contact. And so a lot of things that um, a lot of my students and I were doing, you know, not everyone wants to be, um, may not want to participate in, in a protest or a rally or a march or a visual, but there's always something you can do. Um, so again, we just made sure that you were um, being present, you were standing in solidarity, you were providing opportunities to have these crucial conversations on campus with your individual neighbors, your colleagues. Um, you were able to educate yourself first. So if you want to read, you want to listen to different podcasts, you can look at the 1619 Project, you can look at code switching, you can look at intersectionality uh, matters. There's great podcasts, there are great TED Talks on these individual topics so that you can educate yourself first when coming to the conversation, which I think was awesome, which I think is great. Um, to watch was another great thing. You can watch movies like When They See Us. You talk about police brutality, racial injustice. You talk about the hate you give. You see Freedom Riders. You can donate. So if you feel called to donate to different businesses, different organizations, um, you can donate to the NWCP, the George Floyd Memorial Forum, the American Civil Liberties Union. So again, all these things really came to a head over the summer with Brianna, with George Floyd, with Ahmaud, you know, and more recently with some of the um, things that have happened in our, in our society over the summer. Um, if you want to advocate for policy change, another thing that happened over the summer, and I just put up the hate bill, um, 426 um, was, um, was passed. So that was a great way to encourage your politicians, to urge your local politicians to get a hate bill passed. So when things happen like with Ahmaud, um, with Ahmaud there's, some, there's a charge or there's a bill that can be in, um, enacted to talk about um, to talk about these things in our society. Um, there was a Dreamers Act. You had things about um, DACA recipients that were passed by the Supreme Court this summer. So again, these things are not just limited to one um, ideology or one identity, but again, policy change is one effective way to get involved. Um, I know a lot of times on our campus, we have Political Action Wednesdays that's just started up. So they're giving um, information about how to contact your congressman 
or your senators, how to write legislation, how to actually send um, correspondents to call, what to say um, when you want to have a bill changed or have something um, brought to the floor. So I think that's very important. A lot of things I think are also important for this generation, even for us, we know in November, we're gonna have an election coming up. So making sure that we have voter engagement, making sure that if you don't have an absentee ballot, you get one, or if you're gonna vote in person, that is something you do. If you have not registered, making sure you're registering because again, your vote is your voice. So that's gonna be a really, really big push on campus to seeing some of the things um, we want changed. Another thing that you see in the pictures that I showed here are this equal justice march and visual that we had on our campus. Um, we had this on a Friday with social distancing, masks, um, had over 400 people to participate, faculty, staff, and students. Um, it was a really great turnout. And again, we had a visual where we did a say their names. We talked about, we had a reflective moment of silence um, to talk about things that are going on in our society, police brutality. We tried to engage in informative dialogue and what were the next steps, what were the next um, action items that we could do and what could we do as our community, what could we do on our, our campus. So I think those are very positive moments there. Um, also, outside of that, we did Equal Justice, um, uh, went to the um, Equal Justice Initiative, um, the Legacy Museum in Alabama. We watched Just Mercy. We talked about Brian Stevenson and all the work that he's doing on that political action and um, front there, okay? Um, we started a social justice book club. So that's something an individual could do, a student could do, a professor could also engage in. We are running that, or we did run that from June to December. Each week, we watch a different movie, we read a different book, and we have commentary, we have guest speakers. Um, this week, we just did a, um, a program with Kendi. We partnered with um, some great universities across the state of Georgia and had a live webinar with him. We actually have um, attorney Rye, Angela Rye coming to our city um, um, next week to engage in some conversations with our law school students. So again, we have a lot of opportunities where you can take action, you can have these conversations, you can bring in speakers, you can bring in lecturers. And I think this is really something that you wanna see here. Also, reporting and discrimination. I think it's very important that people, if you do have a student code of conduct or a faculty um, handbook, which most universities have, if not all, being able to report these acts, you know, knowing where to report them, knowing who to call and who, who to talk to about acts of discrimination or harassment or hate crimes and things that happen on campus, because they do happen. And knowing how to get some um, restorative justice once these things do happen on campus, I think are also very, very important. And another thing I want to point out here too, you know, like this work doesn't just now end and this conversation doesn't end when you're an undergrad um, or graduate school. Um, we have to talk about anti-racism in our careers, in our workplace, in our community. So I think that's also a great point to talk about too. Because again, you still have um, HR that deals with a lot of the things that I would deal with on a college level or collegiate level, the discrimination, the sexism, those things too. So again, these things are very prevalent in our community. I think a lot of people are ready to have the conversation so that we can bring about change that we want to see. Now, the third point that I wanted to talk about, we talk about taking action, calling things out, for putting names and labels on things as if they were. But another thing that we want to look at here is the pyramid of accountability. So this is a graphic, just like the pyramid of hate that I um, adopted from a re some researchers and some scholars that I wanted to kind of show here. There's an opportunity for you to leverage all your resources on campus. The one thing that I love about uh, my alma mater at UGA is that there's a ton of resources, a ton of opportunities, a lot of individuals that want to engage in this work from faculty, staff to students, to student groups, student organizations. You even have a lot of community advocacy in Athens. So again, looking at this pyramid of accountability, how can you be an active ally, an accomplice, and even a co-conspirator? And how can you leverage your resources on campus? So one of the things that I was talking about um, with individuals about being ally, like what is allyship? What does that look like? What does that sound like? How can I be a tangible ally? What can I do to help my community? What can I do to even better myself? And a lot of those things that people say, like educate yourself. Don't um, ask individuals that may be experiencing the trauma or the oppression to educate you. Educate yourself first. Um, look for resources. Um, help to amplify those voices of those that may have been marginalized or discriminated against. Um, allow others to take up space, okay? Learn inclusive language. Learn how to use proper pronouns, proper um, proper terms when representing, representing other individuals, okay, in different cultures and different um, ideologies. Experience discomfort. This is going to be uncomfortable. It's going to make you nervous, again, because a lot of these things that we have, we're talking about here are learned behaviors. 
there have been behaviors that have been um, ingrained in our society for years and years and years. And again, it's going to be very, very hard to change the narrative, to have these conversations, to bring about um, some change. Because again, a lot of times people are resistant to change. We've seen that during the civil rights. We've seen that now even with this new generation of human rights advocacy work that we see in the United States. It's going to take a collective whole to make a change, okay? Um, one thing you can do, vote. We talked about that a little bit. Complete the census. I think that's very important um, um, for individuals. Encourage others to do the same. Challenge stereotypes. So when you see someone making a microaggression or um, embracing a stereotype using inclusive, um, exclusive language, you know, making sure that you challenge those. Um, make space for ind individuals. Speak up, not speak over. So even if you are helping to amplify someone's voice, making sure that you're not taking over the conversation if you're going to be a complex. Making sure you're holding the door open for another individual. Something that we saw with the civil rights even the human rights marches and protests and vigils that we saw this summer and even in this fall, you saw a very diverse group of individuals calling for a lot of human rights, calling for a lot of, um, we talked about the Black Lives Matter movement. You saw a lot of individuals, not just one race, not just one um, gender, not one, just one social economic class. You saw people again across all different spectrums coming together to advocate and to talk and to bring accountability and visibility and visibility to these issues, okay? And then if you're going to be a co-conspirator, making sure that you're always vigilant, you're always trying to imagine and create. Some of the greatest things that I've seen from my students were solidarity statements that they made. They took opportunities to raise money for local organizations that were here in our county, in our community that made a difference. Um, they wrote letters. They um, provided moments for advocacy. They held town halls. And these were all things that I'm not pretty sure that you all are doing as well, that they did on their own. So again, I applaud them and I applaud, and applaud your effort as well. Um, the other thing too, you have the Office of Institutional Diversity. You see um, the Mary Frances Early College of Education. You see a lot of different lectures that are going on, speaking engagements. Make sure that you attend these diversity, equity, and inclusion conferences. Making sure that you are a part of the conversation. You're letting your voice be heard. Don't just sit on the sidelines. Another opportunity to, um, to have some dialogue or some discussion is with fraternity and sororities, okay? Because I know that, um, I saw a conversation about diversity in some of our fraternity and sorority organizations on campus that has been a big point of conversation. So again, that's another opportunity to have one of those crucial conversations to engage. And not just them, you also have other multicultural student organizations where you can become co-conspirators with, that y'all can align your different um, opportunities and different resources to make an impact. Um, engage faculty, staff, and even alumni like you're doing right now with these conversations like myself. I think it's a great idea great, great idea. You have um, the Black Alumni Association, women of UGA, young alumni that you can pull into the conversation, which I think is great. Um, the 60th anniversary of desegregation at the University of Georgia is coming up. This is an excellent opportunity to have these conversations, to bring back speakers that um, went to school during this time to talk about their experiences and how they relate now to the experiences that students of color may be even having or conversations or difficulties they may ha be having now. This is a great opportunity to have that conversation. You're going to see the task force on race equity and community that the president set forth here at the University of Georgia. You see the planning committee on diversity and inclusive excellence. So I think those are all great opportunities. You see a lot of uh, money that is being put towards social justice campaign with UGA athletics. So take these opportunities to make sure that this is a movement and not just a moment. And you see here that you already have a great base to get started. And I just implore everyone that this, this is a call to you and you want to make a difference. This is a great, these are all great opportunities to do so. Uh, another great opportunity you have with recruitment and engagement when you're going out recruiting additional students, because again, we need our freshmen to come in. You're looking at programs like Georgia Days and Road Dogs and how does recruitment and retention, um, what does that look like? You know, again, we talk about in higher ed from my perspective as a faculty member, making sure people have a great experience, they feel a part. Uh, a part of the community is really, really important. And lastly, looking at community engagement, service learning, research and advocacy. Um, another way to do something is to get out of Athens, Clark County and make a difference. Um, have those conversations about how the university is impacting the local community. Do research and data um, about disparities in education, the wealth and gender gap. Um, what does that look like? How does that impact me? How will that impact me as an alumni? How will that impact me um, as a, a citizen of the United States. So again, there's awesome, awesome opportunities. A lot of times students will get additional certificates. They will go through diversity and inclusion programs. 
they will look for ways that they can actually make a difference. So I think these are all great opportunities here. Um, books, I just wanted to point out some books that I have in my office. Normally I pull these off my shelf, but right now they have sticky notes all over them because I've been using them all week and all summer. But again, these are just some great books that I found some great information in. Um, movies, I see Netflix parties, we do those all the time. But again, these are some TED Talks done by TEDx UGA. Um, I think these are some awesome opportunities if you want to learn more, educate yourself more. These are great, great opportunities to go forth and do so. 13th was great. Disclosure, when they see us, just mercy. Fruitville Station, Selma. Um, so you want to talk about race, um, um, how to be an anti-racism, white, white rage, the world, um, between the world and me. I just called a few of these labels, but again, these are not, this is not an exhaustive list. Go out on your own and make sure um, you look at these things. Um, another book here, when they call you a terrorist. Okay, so make sure you look at these um, opportunities to engage in conversation and dialogue. Um, just transitioning here a little bit. What we see here is that there is hope on the other side of the tunnel. Um, I pulled this from the Pew Research Center and what I saw is that 57% of Americans in the US have found that um, people are made of many different races and ethnicities are find that it's a very good thing in our country. Um, so we may be seeing a lot of hate speech and might be seeing a lot of divert, divert, um, excuse me, um, divisive language is the word I'm looking for that we may see. But again, research has shown that actually 57% of the population see our um, diversity as a good thing in our country and 20% say that it's somewhat good. And then you have small shares that maybe say that it's somewhat um, very bad or 17% 17 may, 17 may say there's neither good nor bad. But again, you have similar shares of whites, 55%, black, 59%, and Hispanic, 6%, so that racial and ethnic diversity is very good for our country. So again, in spite of sometimes the language that we see, um, some of the conversations that we have to have, there is hope on the um, other side of the tunnel if we continue to move forward. Um, a lot of things that I wanted to point out here is that with these census, um, um, census, um, census data is that you see a lot of times, you see the diversity in the United States. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on those STEM and math, it's just, those are the things that I love. But if you can just see the follow the trend here of diversity um, in the Southeastern where we are, you see in some of the hot spots where in the major cities where there's a lot more diversity than other, but others, but as you can see with the data and the data trends, the, of course the US is becoming increasingly more diverse. We can see that now being reflected in the political diversity, the number of candidates um, that are now women and then also um, people of color that are running for seats in Congress and for the Senate. So again, that diversity is becoming more and more important in the United States. Now you do have people that may see challenges with the country's growing diversity. And this is something that it may be doing to do, um, again, that call to action to talk about. Now, yes, we do have this diversity, but how can we make sure there's equity in all the resources? How can we help make the, um, lessen the wealth gap? How can we close the gender gap? How can we close um, the gap in education and attainment and housing discrimination that we see in our society? So again, there's gonna be challenges and they're gonna be advantages to our diversity. But one final point that I kind of wanted to look at before we get into a close is that, again, um, on this continuum to become an anti-racist, um, you see a lot of times that you have a fear of learning and then even a growth zone. And sometimes we as individuals may be in a fear zone, learning a growth zone, but ultimately if we wanna to get to this anti-racist society, um, we talked about getting to that growth zone, being able to identify how, can I, how I may have benefited from racism, being able to pro and advocate for policies and leaders that are anti-racist. Sitting in your own dis discomfort, speaking when you see racism in action, learning how to educate your peers, don't let mistakes defer you from being better. Yield positions of power. So again, we want to get to that outside blue line, um, blue line there, uh, part of the circle about the growth zone. And then I want to ask you too, will our generation create this anti-racist society? This quote here is by um, the late John Lewis, Congressman John Lewis. He says, every generation leaves behind a legacy. What the legacy will be is determined by the people of that generation. What legacy do you want to leave behind? And so that is the close of my presentation. I just wanna say thank you all. And I want you to reflect on what legacy you wanna leave behind. I want you to see where you are on that continuum to become an anti-racist and do an anti-racist work. Um, are you in the learning zone, the growth zone, or the fear zone? And how can you encourage each other to move past to the next step? And don't just focus on race. We're looking at all facets of diversity. And lastly, when social distancing is no longer a thing, 
make sure it's no longer a thing. Hashtag inclusion. Thank you so much. I love that. Uh, I, that put me in such a great mood. And my Zoom would not work until about 326. So I was stressed coming in here. But now I'm in a much better mood. Thank you for that, Dr. Parker. We're going to transition into a Q&A portion of the event. So you can see you have a Q&A chat box. Uh, if you click that, it's right by your chat and your share screen. But I don't think you all have a share screen. But anyway, it's right by your chat. You can submit questions to us. I will DM you privately to tell you that your question has been selected. And we're going to make you a panelist, which means your video and your mic will be working. You'll be able to talk to Dr. Booker directly. Um, another thing is, because Zoom stressed me out so much, I forgot to do a welcome, so we're going to do that now, and thank you all for coming and welcome all to the first Dialogue with a Dog of the semester. This is very, very historic, because not only does this event have a new name, which is Dialogue with a Dog, but it's the first one we've done via Zoom, and so we're so excited to have you all here, um, and Dr. Rick is just amazing, as you've all seen. Diversity and inclusion in higher education is my interest. Um, I'm a master's student in higher ed right now, so just this was a great way for me to end my workday on a Thursday. And we also have our VP for alumni engagement and our two co-chairs for the event here as well. And as we're waiting for the questions to come in, I can start with a question for you. So um, your first two degrees wasn't really in line with what you do now. Um, you you have a master's in pharmacy, you was interested in science. So I was wondering where did the switch come in and how did that happen? Um, the switch really, um, so let me transition back. So when I was actually getting my master's degree, it was a hybrid program, um, mostly online with the pharmacy degree program. And it was for you to work for the Food and Drug Administration or for you to do something in biological affairs or regulatory affairs. And so when I was doing that, I actually was traveling and working and so I actually actually started working with TRIO program. And so that kind of got me to working with first generation students, sometimes low, in, low income individuals. And that kind of was a passion for me. So like a duality, right? So again, that was an intersection for me um, with my education. And so as I transitioned, I still had the, the passion to study um, STEM and women and um, looking at those um, disparities there in those different programs from a higher education standpoint. And I actually transitioned to the degree that I have now with education because of the job that I was working at the time. And so um, I did want to bring light to that. And so again, um, that is how it kind of transitioned for me. I know a lot of the work that I did talked about bias, talked about um, gender disparities, it talked about um, the gender gap, uh, it talked about racial inequities, it talked about xenophobia in my research. And so again, a lot of that stuff really, really was brought to fruition critical race theory, social cognitive career theory, student development theory. So all those things, and I'm pretty sure Kayla knows because she's going through that right now. Um, you know, that was a kind of, it wasn't the smoothest transition, but somehow it kind of all intersected, if that makes sense. So I was still able to do my passion career, but I wanted to make sure that I was able to, from a higher ed standpoint, that I was working at the university, be able to talk about sometimes the issues and the obstacles that um, people of color, particularly women of color, have to face in a STEM background because that was my lived experience um, when I was an undergrad. So we have a question. Uh -huh. so I'm going to promote the student to Palace. Okay. Hey, everybody, how are y'all? Hi. Hey, Dr. Booker, thank you for coming. Hello. Thank you. Hi. Um, my question for you was, um, how has COVID impacted your work life and how have you maneuvered through um, those barriers? And what would you suggest for us um, college students? Okay, yes. <laughs> um, so for me, um, my institution, we actually um, are back full-time residential. And so for me, from maybe March to uh, mid-May, when we were um, in, I guess the one word I'm looking for, quarantine, not necessarily quarantine is not the right word I'm looking for, but when we were closed, right? Um, that was a transition. So I had to take a lot of my trainings, my lecture series, I had to take a lot of my events and find creative ways to engage students like yourselves, right? Because again, me as an, a working adult, a former alumni of the institution I was working with, I always saw from a graduate perspective. So I just had to find creative solutions and ways to do that. We did Netflix parties, we did a lot of webinars, a lot of Zooms. 
And so towards the end, I noticed that the students were a little bit, had a little bit of Zoom fatigue. So I tried to make sure that I took that into account when um, looking at ideas and creative ways to do social distancing. I know I work with a lot of different student groups and student organizations, um, just helping them to facilitate some of their um, outreach and even their programs, um, things that were not just educational, but also fun and exciting. Um, from we had a whole website called the den that was dedicated to like workouts dedicated to like um, mental health and wellness because that was a big concern um, we had um, ways that students could actually go through virtual learning um, through COVID-19 and look for ways to help inspire them and also to encourage them so a lot of my things was cross collaboration um, I know in the summer when we saw a lot of um, social unrest um, I did a lot of things called let's start the conversation um, where I allowed faculty, staff, and students, and even I did a student town hall so they could express their concerns um, with what was going on in our nation, our country, and our community. Um, so for me, just having a flexibility and adaptability, I think has served me well, and I think will serve you well as a student. Because again, we never know, we may have to transition back to virtual or online learning. Um, for me, the transition was not as hard because again, like I said, my master's at UGA was um, a hybrid program. So I did a lot of online and virtual learning. So I was able to take a lot of those experiences to help my students. Like, hey, you know, talk with your professor. Professor, Communication is key. You know, if you're sick or you're under the weather, you're stressed out, you're having difficulties, make sure you communicate with us, communicate with them. And I think being able to maneuver and adapt, a lot of people during this time were saying, how are you gonna pivot? So I think that was important. Um, again, just work life, making sure that um, I found a balance between work and, um, work and um, my social life as well. Because again, um, I had some individuals to um, pass away that I knew personally from COVID-19. So just making sure that um, I took care of my mental wellness, but I also tried to make sure that I practiced social distancing, practicing the behaviors that I wanted my students to do when they returned to campus to keep us all safe and healthy. Um, I know it was a lot. Um, I, I worked a lot with students who were immune compromised and having conversations with them about how to get um, access and um, safety for them. So again, just being able to pivot, have adaptability, um, allowing yourself room to breathe, giving yourself a measure of grace, taking those mental wellness days if you need them. I think we're all very important aspects of still going through COVID. Because um, I think, again, a lot of times what I've seen now is people just making sure we kind of keep up the social distancing and the hand washing and, you know, um, being um, thoughtful and careful with other individuals. And then even now with the um, with things about the racism and the police brutality, making sure we're having those conversations and having forums to allow people to express their thoughts and their concerns. That was a very long answer to your question. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. You're welcome. And G is my mentee, so I don't want y'all to think I planted her. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't plan her. Hey, G. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Thank you. So you always got to give back students. Once you graduate after the arts, you got to give back. You got to give back. You got to be a great supporter of the alumni network. Um, I can ask another question that we've seen a lot of institutions across the country um, have diversity recruitment and other programs such as mentorships to increase their diversity enrollment. Um, but what should they be doing once the students arrive to campus? Excellent question. I think a lot of times what universities do, um, you know, when you look at universities as Hispanic serving, they got that designation, if they have a, <clears throat> a designation of predominantly white or either historically black um, college or university, we have to make sure that, yes, we do a lot to with recruitment, right? But again, a lot of things that we talk about um, on a higher education level is like student retention, right? So again, retention is being able to retain those students that you recruited. So yes, it's great that you've recruited these diverse students, whether it's race, ethnicity, religion, social economic status, veteran status, ability, um, those things are great. But again, making sure those students feel included, making sure they're feeling welcome, making sure they feel the support that they um, and, the, and the celebration of them at the institution. So for me, what I want to highlight and make sure is that you have opportunities, you have forums for them, like you have if they want to do a crucial conversation series that you allow that if there's a town hall opportunity that you allow that to happen if you find that the students are struggling with social economic needs whether it's a food insecurity whether it's a housing insecurity you have programs you have grants you have um scholarships available to those students because again um 
those needs are very um, those needs are very very high sometimes for our students. Sometimes it comes to these um, these already particularly marginalized populations that you have safe spaces on campus where our LGBTQ plus community students. Um, you have multicultural student organizations that reflect people, not only their heritage, but you also celebrate that. I know we're doing a lot for Hispanic Heritage Day. I'm um, excuse me, Hispanic Heritage Month. Let me take that back. We are also doing an, um, the Amogi National Indian Mound celebration this weekend. So you're making sure that you're, ha you're celebrating individuals, you're celebrating their diversity, you're making sure that it's on the forefront, forefront of them. If you see they have um, an access issue, that you're making sure that you're getting them to the Access and Accommodations Office. Um, so basically what you're doing is you're making a space for them. You know, we talked about and then accountability, you're making a space for them. Um, you're allowing them to be heard. Um, you are allowing them to engage in the conversations. Like I know a lot of times um, you have faculty and staff that reach out to students and let them have a voice, let them have a seat at the table. I think a lot of times with these committees and these councils that they um, create are great opportunities to engage students, to ask them what their resources or what they need. I know at our university, we have a lot of federal trio programs. I know at you all's university, y'all have a lot of federal trio programs, like student support services, the McNair program. And again, a lot of these opportunities are providing resources to help those students stay, um, stay on campus, whether that's academic support, financial support, um, that community support, those safe spaces, I think are great opportunities um, for those students and making room and making space for them. I think it's always, always, um, important to making sure that you're retaining them. Mentorship was another big thing that I even found in my dissertation. Making sure that faculty and staff are able to mentor those students are also really, really big and key. Um, well, as we know, this COVID-19 pandemic is rampant and it's still around. Um, we also have a new class, especially here at, I'm sure at Mercer and you know, at UGA, the class uh -huh. of 2024. So yeah. I know as an orientation leader, a lot of students, um, I've just been checking in on them, they've really been Kind of mm -hmm. depressed and just kind of down about not mm -hmm. being able to meet people and just not being able to have yeah. a true college experience. So, mm -hmm. um, what would you say to a student in the freshman class about how to just navigate college life and how to just still thrive or just be a successful college student at these times? Yes, and so for me, what I have um, noted with students, and again, we have to take into consideration and reflect because not only are they not having the traditional quote unquote college experience, they may have missed their homecoming, they may have missed their graduation, they may have been, they may have been dealing with this since, you know, early of 2020, right? So again, we just make sure that we had a lot of um, opportunities for our students. Um, we did like virtual graduation parties um, as students transition. I know for those individual students, I know we've had opportunities where we did um, smaller face-to-face -face events, you know, of course, for social distancing and masks provided so that students could engage. We did a lot of outdoor events. Um, I know Campus Life on my campus um, have put together a, a lot of different events, um, like a silent rave headphone party with social distancing. We did a multicultural mixer on outside on the lawn. Um, what else did we do? Um, I know for me personally, out of my office, we've been doing a lot of Zoom or verbal, or not verbal, but virtual events, um, a lot of Netflix events, a lot of speakers, um, things of that nature. Again, trying to do as much virtual and also face-to-face -face as we could, um, having opportunities for students to meet and still be involved in very, very small, small events. Um, I know our football schedule and a lot of our sporting events that students like to attend and outdoor activities. Um, Rick Sports did a great job coming up with some creative outdoor events, weekend activities for students to be engaged in. We did painting on the lawn one time. So we tried to be very creative in student affairs to make sure that students were still safe and healthy, but still get somewhat of the experience, right? Um, whether it was doing like multicultural food nights in the cafeteria, um, that was another way we tried to kind of engage them in conversations. I know our residence hall, um, um, RAs, um, they did some great events in smaller in smaller little pockets and pods to make student, sure students got to meet each other, um, got to engage. I know our heritage event that we're doing, we are doing that virtual in October, and that's a traditional event that we're trying to keep alive. So a lot of the traditional stuff that students would normally get, even through orientation, we did try to still have those but try to be very creative with ways in which we do that by adding music, by adding speakers, 
by adding videos, you know, trying to keep them engaged. And again, because we know that students are dealing with a lot. And so again, hopefully um, we'll be able to engage in more face-to-face -face, um, activities and more larger group activities in the spring. And so um, I do look forward to that. And so again, with our students, know that we will have you first year, second year, third, and even fourth year. So just making sure um, that you hold on for this little time that we're, we're just trying to keep everyone healthy. Um, what else do we do? Off of the alumni associations, we call students. Um, we checked on them. We did wellness activities. We did a lot of um, workout activities too. So just trying to find different ways to stay engaged. And then also making sure that students, they don't forget, they should also look on like um, through campus communications to see ways in which they can participate. Maybe do some outdoor activities and they're staying, you know, in communication with their friends from home, their family members too. And they're just actually still being engaged and being connected. Well, since we only have a few minutes left, is there any just last words you want to give to the students, Dr. Berger? Um, Be the change that you want to see. Um, I think that's very important because again, you all, your generation is going to be a generation that brings about this change. And I just think about with John Lewis and his legacy and a lot of other civil rights icons that we even lost this summer, they started to participate in the social justice work at 17, 18, 19, and 20. Um, a lot of these different um, political action committees were started in college dorm rooms. You know, they started on college campuses. So just making sure that if you do want to engage, you do want to empower, you do want to uplift, and that is your, if that's going to be your ministry um, to the world, that's going to be your gift to the world, we can all join hands and make sure that we're providing for an equal and equitable opportunity with justice, um, literally for all of our citizens and all of us as individuals, regardless of our um, ethnic background, regardless of our religious background, regardless of any of those things that others may try to use to marginalize us. And again, just keep pressing on. Again, this is a very difficult time, but we will get through this together. No dog barks alone. Um, if you need me, I'm always here to help. I'm always here to provide opportunities and resources and just go forth and do great things. Thank you so much. And thank you for everyone for attending this event, you can follow the Student Alumni Council on Instagram and Twitter, SAC under, no, UGA underscore SAC, um, to get updated on more events such as this. Uh, we have another dialogue with a dog next month. In fact, Jack Harris, you wanna talk more about it? Sure, so each month we are gonna have a dialogue with a dog for this semester. So next month's dialogue with the dog is gonna be with Mr. Eric Jones. He is a current um, class of 2020 40 under 40 um, nominee. So we're so excited to have him in our midst. So please make sure that when you get those emails, please make sure to sign up and get these opportunities. Um, I always say engage students, please to engage alumni. So we'd love to have you at our events. Yes, and the purpose is to give you all connection with alumni. So now you have a connection with Dr. Berger that you can use throughout your time here at EGA. And that is all, unless any of the jokarias or any of the chairs have any more last words they want to share. Just thank you. Thank you all for being here. And Dr. Booger, thank you so much. I always love to hear you speak and you just bring a lot of class and a lot of um, expertise to all of the conversations that you have with me or other students at UGA. So thank you. And thank, thank you to you my chairs as well. Yes, it was an awesome uh, experience. I'll say and my advisor, yeah. thank you. Yeah, we're, we're so happy to have you, and it's a great way to kick off the year with having you speak, and I think I can speak for everyone. We're really, really appreciative of you coming and sharing your words. So. Just to reiterate what everybody said, yes, thank you for everything that you've done for us today, and I just thank you for your flexibility, and um, everybody on here for just being able to hop on the Zoom. I know that sometimes it's become really repetitive, but mm -hmm. it's really all appreciated, so thank you so much. Okay, well, thank you all for coming.